Hey everyone, welcome back. Um, my <laughs> <laughs> and I say and I back. say welcome back when I mean that uh, it's your first time listening to this, and it's our first time producing this. Um, this is the playwrights. My name is Will, and my name is Sarah. This is our little podcast about big plays, and <laughs> that, <laughs> and that's a work in progress. Uh, what this podcast is is uh, it's me and Sarah's uh, little exercise in. Play, talking about plays yeah so each week we'll read a new play and we'll discuss it and you guys will be able to read along with us if you want yeah it's like a little book club isn't it yeah and you just listen to what we think and you listen to what we think <laughs> and <laughs> no but like yeah like you listen to what we think and then you maybe email us and tell us that we're idiots or maybe you agree with us or but look it's and we'll the have podcast some of you on and we're gonna have yeah we're gonna have a fun time with this podcast Tell the good people of this audience, tell our audience, what are we what are we talking about today? So today we decided to start off with a lovely play called The Humans by Stephen Karam. Stephen Karam, he is a wonderful little guy. Yes, he is. So let me break down his little life for you, his big life, if you will. I um, want to hear all about Stephen Karam. No, please. He's or from... is it Karam? Um, so he's from Scranton, Pennsylvania, which Scranton, is, yeah, That's... which is a fun city, the office, if you will. Um, he's from Lebanese American family, and they actually practice um a Maronite faith, which I didn't know this before I researched. But, okay, and being I was raised Catholic, still am Catholic. It's an Eastern Catholic faith. Maronite. Maronite. Mar Maronite. Maronite? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I've never heard of them. I was fascinated. But it makes sense because this story, there's a lot of Catholic themes in there. Yeah, the story, the story that they're, they're Catholic. We'll yeah. Get, we'll get into that in a little Causes bit. Causes a lot of tension. Um, yeah. But he went to Brown and then he apprenticed at the Utah Shakespeare Theater where he met his collaborators, Arian Moyad and TJ Paparelli. And Paparelli. They, Paparelli. And they helped him produce The Humans in Chicago. And he currently teaches at the New School while writing plays that appear on and off Broadway. His other big plays that he wrote was Sons of Profit in 2011. And it was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize okay. in 2012, which is amazing. And then he also prepared an adaptation of The Cherry Orchard that went on Broadway. Amazing. Originally by Anton Chekhov. But his adaptation had Celia Keenan Bulger. It, who's wait? Sorry, who's that? Celia is she played Varia in Cherry Orchard, which is okay. the same part I played when I was in it. Love, gotta what? just throw little brownie points. But yeah, um, but she played Scout in, in, in To Kill the a Mockingbird, recent production of Kill a Mockingbird. Yeah, Aaron Sorkin. Yeah, nice. yeah, which is like would love to play Scout. Nice. Yeah. Um. You would love to play Scout. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, you've said that before. Yeah. I would love to name, like, a pet or a child scout. Well, that's very different from <laughs> playing the part. Anyways, he is also a screenwriter. He wrote, wrote Speech and Debate, which is off of his 2006 play. Yeah. I've never seen either or I read have, either. Well, Speech and Debate went on, like, it it exploded. Not literally, but it, like, a lot of regional theaters <laughs> were producing it. It's I've heard it's very good. Yeah. But also sad. Honestly, we'll probably read it later. Maybe we could do a whole series on Karam. And then also, he wrote the screenplay The Seagull, which had my girl Sersha as Nina in it. Have we seen that movie? I have not seen that movie. No, but I need to. Yeah. Yeah. But, okay, sorry. I know I'm screaming about Karam, but I love when I read things that people say about like uh, the playwrights like writing or their style. So I, I found a couple quotes. Um, the New York Times, Les Alexis Solovsky says that he specializes in painful comedies that shouldn't be as funny as they are, and he writes about loss and less haphazard necessary ways we get on with our lives afterwards. Mm. And I was like, that's so poignant and beautiful, especially the current state of our world. Like, yeah. I really identify with that sentiment. Uh, this, well, having only read one of his plays, it's like he, his, his, his characters are so tragic, but in the everyday, like he is certainly a student of Arthur Miller in a lot of ways where he, where every man who also is like a defeated person, um, who's just been 
beaten by society it seems like and like that's like literally every character in this union oh it's yeah like, it's for like, sure it's and like every like an... it's like every character is death of a salesman <laughs> sure but also it's, it's really like sad. It's, it's more updated oh more yeah like what they're struggling with i mean one of the characters amy just broke up with her girlfriend and like but yeah that love loss is greater to her than her losing her job which i thought was fascinating oh interesting we'll yeah we'll talk that. well yeah we'll talk about that in a um bit. also the huntington theater company said he can be funny in remarkably few words which i totally agree with and we'll hit on this later and he is quick to note that he starts his plays with the basics character and plot so i thought it was important to include this quote because in my contemporary drama and context class, shout out to Jay Jasky, we would go over Aristotle's six ways that he would like break down plays. It would be like plot, character, oh, 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 right, right, yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah, spectacle, melody. Spectacle's number one, isn't it? Well, don't get me started. Okay. In our class, we would choose like, okay, which which two did this playwright choose? But this leads us into. The Humans, which was commissioned by the Roundabout Theater, and it won the Tony Award in 2016 for Best Play. Will, take it away. Give us the history on this. Commissioned by Roundabout Theater Company, which is a banger of a theater company. They are the, like, premier for, like, new plays, and they do all sorts of really incredible stuff. And so it's no surprise that they were in on this The Humans. Now, this comes out in 2015. He's writing it, I don't know, years before that, obviously. It really is a pro. It's certainly a product of its time. It is. It almost has a weird premonition to it because it's written for New Yorkers, I think, for sure. Mm. And it's written, it's written at a time in America where people are understanding that this system that we have, call it capitalism, call it the American dream, Call it whatever you want. American dream is a dead baby. Right. And that's the whole, that's the play, yeah. right? Is that the American dream literally does not exist. And so he's writing it for this generation of people, us, who are bogged down with student debt, who don't feel like they have a future, who, and whose parents continually judge them for decisions. And so he's writing it for the younger generation, the millennials, and also he's writing it he's writing it for the millennials and their parents because mm-hmm. you see even if your situation isn't as extreme as what happens with the Blake family you see the conversations that they are having are had at at every Thanksgiving dinner across America there is it's very triggering it's <laughs> i was <laughs> so triggered by this and i for the most part even agree with my parents on most things Right, and I don't. <laughs> Sarah's looking at me like, "How dare you?" <laughs> <laughs> no, I, just I, don't I agree. like I do agree with my parents on most things, politically and religiously. I was even triggered by it. It's a generational struggle. He's writing it for these this people on the verge of co- this society on the verge of collapse, and it's perhaps only a coincidence, or maybe a premonition. That in the 26, because it came out in 2015, when it was first produced, but in 2016, we get Trump and Sanders, Sanders slash Hillary, breaking American politics. Like, they just destroyed it. They exposed flaws in the system, and Bernie comes up, and he's like, he's all about the socialism, and he's all about, like, like, let's give everybody a fair shot. Capitalism doesn't work anymore. Then you've got Trump on the other side who's saying, like, capitalism does work. It's the political system that's broken, and we need or, to we need to burn that to the ground. Or, Trump. or I'm just <laughs> – or Trump says, I'm just an idiot, and I love playing golf or whatever he says. I don't know. I don't pretend to know what's in that guy's head. It's so interesting because this is a – this is a play that is of current America, but it was written before current America. Which is fascinating that this guy had this so much insight into like where we were heading because we see the we we saw the cracks in our society before this the 2016 election and they've only been ripped apart. So yeah, so that's kind of who it's for. I don't know. It's just it's just it would be so fascinating for some of our friends to sit down and watch this play with their parents and just see what happens because that's oh my gosh, it would be amazing. 
Yeah, that's a that's an because interesting you, you, experiment. You see you see yourself up there. Right. Even if So let's break down the synopsis Sarah, Sarah, because Sarah, you're give giving me, a lot of I am giving facts a lot away. A lot, I am it, giving yeah. a lot of away. But what do you think the story was? Like like Well, what? let me just give a brief like one sentence of what's actually and, happening. And let me preface this with saying like if you have not read this play, go out and get yourself a copy and maybe find yourself a bootleg version of it on Broadway. <laughs> Um, honestly great it's if you want a pdf it's highly recommended reach out (laughs) um yeah like would you like i guess like for our people who have not read it like would you recommend they read it yeah yeah it's It's incredible it's It's one of it's one of the best plays i've read in a while so yeah so spoiler alert kind of like if you don't want to know anything about the play i would come Stop back listening. once you, yeah i would I'd come back once you finish. all right all right go ahead sarah this play is about a family that gathers together at thanksgiving for a dinner that's held at bridget and richard's new york apartment in chinatown sarah are bridget and richard married no they're not Get oh out my of gosh they're scandalous co- they're cohabitating they're cohabitating it's scandalous to this to the catholic parents yes. if you will Eric and Deirdre. So they're constantly judging Bridget, laying down little clues. Yeah. Here's a statue of the Virgin Mary to keep in your home. It would just make me feel better. Or right. here, let me pack you a starter kit because you don't know how to live on your own. Oh, even yeah, though she does that. Richard is 38 and Bridget is 26, which yeah. is also something else that they're not super a big fan of. They're not, they're not on board with that. But like at the same time, like the parents have, in a lot of ways, accepted that their daughter's they've quit being catholic basically like they right they're like there's um a, there's you know how we there. stand on the situation yeah. and we won't let it go but like right. i understand how you don't follow our ways yeah but the most interesting parts of that whole storyline i think is eric and amy amy is the 34 year old daughter to eric they went through the morning of 9-11 yeah so you find that out kind of slowly through the play that like yeah they were in new york city on 9-11 right and that really impacted eric in like a huge life way where amy she's kind of like stifled it and thinks it's like yeah yeah. she's like yeah sad things happen all the time that was a horrible day it was just a coincidence that we were there because they're from yeah. they're from Scranton, Pennsylvania, which they hate on all the time. I'm so sorry. So they live outside in New York City, and Eric had never been to New York City before that morning. So he hates it. So he hates it and gets scared and triggered every time he has to like go into it and judges it constantly and hates that the girls live there. But Eric, the whole Catholic storyline for him, he's just like, we went through this horrible experience together. We didn't die, and we could have right. like so easily. Because she was, like, going into a job interview. They're all around uh, the Twin Towers all day or, like, all he morning. Was, he was supposed to go up to the yeah, observation, observation deck. deck, like, the observation floor. But it wasn't open yet because it right. opened at 930, I guess. And he was and there the, at, like, 815. The, yeah, the, cra- the planes crash at, I don't know, 845 or 830, yeah. whatever. So it was, like, really coincidental that he wasn't in those buildings. And he views it as a almost gift from god a chance oh certainly yeah yeah new life to really devote himself and like believe amy is just like yeah dad i don't know bad things happen and so like i think that's the most kind of she's kind of brushed it off or yeah stifled it i think stifled it probably but i think that's the most interesting aspect that came out of that more religious storyline that i wasn't expecting because you're hearing deirdre kind of be the voice of catholicism throughout the whole play and then it reaches kind of almost that climactic point with eric where he's like how could you go through this and not believe i i just don't get it and i was like yeah Yeah. i thought that was pretty powerful yeah yeah and so like the rest of the story Obviously, like, they're there for Thanksgiving. Eric's mom, Momo, is this 79-year-old woman in a wheelchair, confined to a wheelchair. She's got dementia. She's, you know, continually babbling nonsense. And she has, you know, she, they, they keep saying uh, that she's, oh, she's just having a bad day. Like, oh, man, I, I hate for you girls to see her on, on this bad day. That's really indicative, I think, of, I don't know, the way that the parents are handling that sickness. And of course, there's the whole Amy and Richard thing, which is just like they're—I don't know—they're—they're they're, they're, they've Bridget just and Richard? sorry, Richard, yeah, Bridget and Rich, Bridget, 
<laughs> and Richard, who, like, they've just moved into this apartment together. Everything's breaking inside of it. Yeah, everything's breaking, and then they have, like, loud neighbors, but it's, like, a, the apartment is on, like, two levels, and so they feel like there's an upstairs and a downstairs, and they're like, yeah. there's nowhere in New York that you can have this type of apartment. This is such a steal, but everything inside is breaking. Every Yeah, yeah, and so on, like, a superficial level, when you just expect, like, something to be new, you, ex- I don't know, you, you see that, oh, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. Or this isn't as good as I thought it was going to be. Either. Yeah, I feel like that kind of speaks to, you could almost compare it with Bridget and Richard's relationship. Because there's one point in the play where Bridget and Amy are having like sister time upstairs, kind of. She's like, yeah, I don't know. It was like all so easy before it was like so official. And that was like, speak- Who, like speaking to Bridget and like Richard's right. relationship. How before they moved in together, before they went through all this. You know, they had, like, an easier time getting along. Everything felt, like, so simple and easy and beautiful. But then now that they're, like, moving in together and making it official, it feels so much more complicated. Right. They have so many more things to deal with. Also, the parents nagging. And so she's just, was this worth it? Or were we happier before we before. took this next step? Oh, I see. So, like, the they're dealing with the consequences of making their relationship more meaningful. Right. Or more... And- And there's this, like, beautiful line in the play. I think it's one of the most, one of the things that really hit me was when Amy said, maybe loving someone long-term is more about deciding whether to go through life unhappy alone or unhappy with someone else. Oh, yeah, I love that line. That really hits you because, like, love is, like, such a, it's a choice when you're in a relationship after that first honeymoon phase. Yeah. Right? It is. When you're unhappy in life as, like, an individual, sometimes you can place that, like, on your partner or blame that. But really, it's about the unhappiness of that single person. And they're like, well, I can't control my own happiness. Will this other person make me... At least make it bearable. Yeah. Is it better to just be alone in this or with someone in this thing we called life? Right. That's gonna lead to a lot of unhappy situations but a lot of happy situations sure but like sure i don't know i was just like yeah that really hit hard and i thought that was really interesting point that amy brings up later when she's talking about her relationship but then all bridget starts it off yeah was this worth it yeah, yeah. so <laughs> they so, obviously said. so they, they sit down to thanksgiving dinner all this like this dysfunctional family and like you see like they all like really love each other Oh like my they gosh. do. Yeah, like, and they and have the, and the, so many traditions and like Yeah. And I think that was a really powerful thing to see that like these people don't hate each other. They are a family, they are close. The parents are sad that the girls are both in New York and like they're not in Scranton. But and, you really you see these people like especially like the younger ones where you turn into like this adolescent person when you're around your family when you're in those situations where your dad or your sister or your mom can make you feel like so angry at like the drop of a hat like the littlest thing they say can like set you off yeah there's like so much history there yeah and i feel like steven like really writes that beautifully where steven the playwright the playwright you, yeah, because yeah, yeah. we're on a first name basis <laughs> yeah yeah honestly that's how i feel always when i read a play is uh, i feel like steven. i've seen a piece of their soul Oh, in their sh- writing. Oh, for sure. And so then I feel like we're on a first name basis after that. Steve-O. <laughs> Steve-E. Anyway, so I think I really identified with Bridget, <laughs> unfortunately, because I feel like she was the angstiest one of the bunch at some points. Yeah, you're, you're be, for sure a Bridget. Yeah, she'd be like really hard on her mom, like constantly. And then Amy at one point, pardon my French, but she turns to Bridget and she's just like, why are you being such a bitch? <laughs> and you're just like, Why yeah. is she being such a bitch? And I think Bridget in that moment is like, why do I, why do I revert That's, to this yeah. when I'm around them? When like my mom's, yeah, like, she's like constantly like this. Why am I still surprised? Why am I still insulted? Right. Yeah. Like Bridget is in a really weird place in her life because she's not like necessarily a failure. Like, she has, like, she's got, like, an okay job in retail or whatever, but she's trying to be a musician. musician. And she is, like, working really, really hard. And you find out 
like later in the play that she like the news that she gets that she has been fighting an upstream like she's been swimming upstream basically because her professor without her knowledge has been sending this bad recommendation letter to everybody to tr- she's trying to get like grants to write music basically correct me if i'm wrong she's not like a rock musician she's not going to like clubs. No. no she's like a serious like composer yeah yeah okay like, an orchestra. like at, at first yeah exactly I, at first i thought she was like like a country singer who was like i was like what are you doing like no 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 no. she's like a serious musician she is a com- trying to be a composer and her professor has given her given everybody this really bad recommend let's say a middling recommendation letter that like oh she's work she works really hard but she's just not that talented yeah and she's not i think one of the lines is like she's not as content as talented as her contemporaries <laughs> aka like, just the other people in her class yeah. <laughs> like she's just not very good Gosh, she's like such a great person and like she hasn't known this and she's only just found out that like her professor has been really just really just not doing her any favors and, and so she's she been has... sw- swimming upstream there and her parents um, are harping on her just that she's not doing enough and and richard comes to her defense which i thought was kind but he's just like richard you have no Amy, idea richard and bridget have yeah like they a have a good great re- relationship like, actually yeah like they like i was expecting it to be like really fall apart yeah like but it doesn't yeah i don't know i think i just like expect that in plays where it's like oh they're happy now but yeah. just wait yeah they were okay they came out a little yeah, they were fine. yeah the, the parents are constantly judging bridget who filed for unemployment she yeah. gets money under the table she oh, is yeah, that's right. she, she's trying to apply for grants but like you know, she just can't catch a break in her life or with her parents, basically. No, yeah. Yeah. So, and I think the biggest plot in this comes from... The dreams. No? Well, we can go there. Sorry, what were you going to say? No, I was going to say the secret. Oh, the secret. The secret that the parents have been keeping from their children. And are, it, it, there's glimpses of it. And just to let you know, like this whole play is it's one big scene, right? It's not broken into like it's it takes place in real time over like what an hour and a half or whatever hour forty five, and because the stage is divided, let me give us a little background. The stage is divided. There's a top floor and a bottom floor, right? And so you can see everything, and none of the characters ever go off stage. It doesn't seem like which I'm obsessed with, unless they go to the bathroom. Sure, yeah. Which we shout don't, out to we, Amy for having bowel ulcerative struggles. colitis. Yeah, I mean she has it way worse than some of us but i identify <laughs> she yeah she always is apologizing like sorry the bathroom stinks <laughs> it's like anyway Pouring. yeah so the parents are like whenever they get a chance like a moment alone they're like are we gonna tell them now and they're like no nah, we'll tell them later and you can tell like eric is pretty panicky about it eric is having a time of it he is in full-blown panic mode most of the play and he is trying to like brush it off as like oh no i'm just tired or and he gets drunk a little bit and he thinks he starts like seeing things like outside like whatever ghost oh, he yeah, kind of has trying to see he does or just like he always thinks it's like a person outside or he's always on edge and and the noises that are coming from upstairs are really upsetting him. him so he's on edge and you and the audience we the audience do not know why like the entire play yeah until the very very maybe the last what 10 pages which i thought were spectacular i think i mean i've read and seen so many plays where you see like a whole family argument like blown out over five pages and everyone has their say everybody has their say somebody ends up dead no (laughs) but like that's where i was like like is is he gonna have a heart attack like yeah die but (laughs) Um, the grandma no but it's it's so well written at the end because he so the secret is spoiler the secret last is, chance last chance oh god if you're still listening um the secret is that he hadn't he cheated on deirdre with a teacher a at teacher the school at the high school he works at. Work at yeah and um so he got fired because there's a morality clause because he worked at a private school and they don't have any savings and they're having to pay for Momo's wheelchair. Medication like you can, and, and medication. Kind of <laughs> yeah, just her wheelchair. That was silly. <laughs> they're, they're paying literally thousands of dollars a for month for the wheelchair. wheelchair. But it flies. Um, <laughs> no. Worth it. <laughs> um, but it is. And the girls are like, 
oh, okay, well, are you guys going to be okay? Like, he's working another job, or worked at a local Walmart now. Or, actually, not a local Walmart, a Walmart outside of town so his high school students don't see him at the Walmart, which I thought was funny. That's accurate. Yeah. That's what I would do. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they're having to sell their house and move into an apartment because they're, like, so in debt and right. financially, like, unstable right, right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and, they, and they have given up their dream because they had to sell their lake property as well. The lake property that they never got to build a cottage on. Like, they were always, like, planning to. And they had this beautiful property, I guess, and whatever. Yeah, I got kind of got the impression, because he was close to retirement, where I got the impression that they were going to move to that lake house sure. once he retired. Yeah, probably. And so... Like, they had it made at one point. Like, they were they had it all together I think he was point. a year and a half from retirement. Yeah, so they were, like, they were doing fine. Yeah. I guess Momo gets sick. I think what's beautiful about the way Stephen writes the ending is that Eric confesses all these things to his daughters. There's a car called for them, so the car is waiting outside. Because every- they're drunk. Because they're drunk and have to go home. Right. But the daughters... I, fe- I felt seen because it's not easy hearing something like that or dealing with it. They left. The girls they are like, leave. I can't, they I just can't leave. do this. There's like hardly any conversation about it. Which is incredible. It's very realistic. And at this and like and, and satisfying. Like, it's very and satisfying because like you don't there's nothing to talk about because yeah. the parents have worked it out. Allegedly. I don't they probably haven't. And there's like, like little moments where Eric tries to like appeal to Amy that's where he confesses like the whole thing of like i was changed the whole uh 9 oh, 11 ni- like, comes to like a head when he's talking to her and she's just like i can't deal with this right yeah, now and yeah. like walks out yeah you know they're rushing out of the house right after this whole confession yeah and deirdre goes where's bridget and amy says with rich and then the stage directions say deirdre looks to amy for more information as amy helps momo into her coat and then amy says she's embarrassed she's I don't want to get into it. Why is she embarrassed? Is she embarrassed because when your whole image of your parents kind of comes crashing down and you like maybe you were like holding them up like on a pedestal like that can be embarrassing because it's like, why was I so stupid to think that these people were unshakable? Um, and I guess why, this is like Richard. He hasn't been around them very much. He hasn't been around. The, yeah, Richard has. Uh, this is the first time they've met him, I think. Yeah. And so she's embarrassed. Well, she's embarrassed. I mean, frankly, she's embarrassed about how the whole night has gone because her parents are so drunk that they can't drive home. And which, I mean, to be fair, it's like an hour and a half drive or whatever. But they have to call them a car. You know, her parents are. Her parents are essentially at the same place that she is. You know, and she's 26 and she is just trying to get her life off the ground. And her parents are, I don't know, she just sees herself maybe in her parents as like she's just never going to be able to succeed, basically. Yeah. But the only difference is Bridget has Richard, who has this trust fund. That he's got access I wanted, to in four years. I wanted numbers on Richard's trust fund because I'm a nice all I Look, all I thought when he had the trust, when I found out he has the trust fund, it's like, oh, no wonder the character named Rich has a trust fund. Just I was like, Steve, you're the nightmare. I was like, Steve, like, oh, Steven, the playwright, like, why would you name, why would you name the rich character Richard? Like, that's dumb. I honestly. I thought that was a little too on the nose. I never would have thought of that. Well, I only thought of it like two hours after I read the play. <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't really thinking about it while I was reading fair. it. I just no. thought that was dumb. That's they call our, him that's rich our biggest, through the whole play. That's our biggest critique. Um, no. Also, I thought when it comes to Bridget and Richard's relationship, kind of mirroring Eric and Deirdre's, an interesting setup to the secret that Stephen laid out for us was in the stage directions. I thought it's really beautiful because I love like stage pictures and i think they're like really important when steven describes bridget and richard's relationship as opposed to eric and deirdre's i think it's really powerful because it takes place in the stage directions and it says the stage picture should subtly highlight bridget and richard's flawed but alive connection and the gulf between eric and deirdre 
I just thought that was like spectacular and it's so it gives like the actors and the directing team like such like good nuggets to kind of cling to in developing their characters right it's telling it's telling like what the audience should see but like not exactly how to do it like there's so many ways you can interpret that right yeah that was really nice I thought that he gave a lot of free like he he's like I really want this picture but I'm not gonna tell you exactly how to do it and it's a hint for the plot that comes later on for the is secret. that before is that before the secret yeah that's like yeah okay that's before gotcha um and and you see any time that bridget or richard give a moment of affection it pains eric and deirdre yeah and you're like that's weird why right like i was like that is weird but it, it, what's it, it, happening? and you can and you can as an audience member you can attribute it to so many different things like Oh, do they feel weird because like Richard is so much older than her? Do they feel weird because they're living together but not married? Do they like they could feel weird be- for all, any number of reasons, but you don't know at the time. So it's yeah, it's it's really good writing. Right. Good. So I just thought, yeah, there's I mean, there's six characters in this, and they're each so unique, and it was so easy like hearing their voices throughout. I just thought the plot's amazing and the writing. Yeah. For each of these characters is pretty spectacular. It is. Someone I want to hit on before we move on. Deirdre. We haven't talked about Deirdre hardly at all. Hardly at all. The sweet the sweet mother trying her best. <laughs> I thought her whole eating disorder was like very interesting. She would like eat her feelings. That's like her Yeah, she's um, overweight and she's Yeah, and yeah. so she constantly talks about her weight, constantly talks right. about she's tra- trying to like I'm on I'm back on weight wa- weight watchers. Right. I'm, yeah. I thought Eric was such a jerk at one point. I want to reread this knowing the secret, I think, because there's a lot of moments where Eric is, like, pretty rude to Deirdre. Like, one point, they bring out the dessert, and he's like, oh, she'll grab the one with the most frosting. Oh, yeah. And then Deirdre, like... Oh, she, yeah, it's a stage direction. It's a stage direction where it's like, that is the one she was going to choose, but now... That now she does. She, she second one guesses. One. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was sad. It's so sad, and it's just, like, moments of that where I'm like, Eric, you cheated on her, and you're still, like so terrible to her and she like gives so much like takes care of his mother like it was her mother like all this stuff and like gives so much to the girls she talks down to them and is judgmental and all this stuff but you see the pain of the woman that is antagonizing like the daughters and you i don't know where you totally see like the humans you know you see their flaws oh Oh, the play, the play title. title. Um, you see their flaws, but you still feel for that. You feel like empathetic, and you understand like their pain and their whole journey. Well, like there's the whole dream. Like they keep talking about dreams. Richard and Eric talk about dreams a lot because they're both having like weird dreams throughout the from the last couple nights. And Richard is like this kind of like arms armchair psychiatrist or whatever. He took so he's two trying psychology to, classes. He's, he's trying to so he's trying to like interpret his dream. It was a very good like well-drawn portrait of manhood where the younger man is trying to psychoanalyze the older man but the older man isn't giving everything that isn't being vulnerable even if it's not on purpose so eric continually Ah. he continually claims that he cannot remember the dream but throughout the play he starts to remember bits and pieces of it so he first is like oh like yeah i had a weird dream i can't remember it and then he's like yeah there was like this faceless woman i'm like i don't know what that means like haha like and he kind of laughs it off or whatever and then it's not until the very end where he remembers the faceless woman that he saw on 9-11 who had like the melted face she he Ah. saw like a fireman like carrying this corpse of this woman out out of a building whatever and he saw like her ash covering her face slash her face was just like melted yeah. or something like that some like grisly image and so he's been having this dream but at the same time like that woman is amy maybe at the same time and so he's like yeah he's know, like daughters... so triggered about losing them yeah that he like pushes them away and i think he's like scared of that vulnerability or like to admit that because he only admits that like at his most like desperate moment right it's it that is a really interesting point though about how richard is so comfortable with um everything that he experiences 
like as a human being Richard's and being very, very open. And yeah. so is Bridget. You know, they make fun of them for going on like juice cleanse and meditating and like. Yeah. Being... Oh, I wanted to talk to you about that that therapy discussion. Um, what did you think of that? <laughs> because because. So the therapy discussion is like Bridget is like, ah, like I need therapy and like I want my parents to pay for it, basically (laughs) like classic millennial. But the but Eric brings up like, you know, well, you know, people in my family, we never had to go to we never had to go to therapy because we had we had our faith to guide us. Here's the thing. And I was like, I've had that same thought. Of like Sarah's looking at me like I'm literally crazy. No, I think you're insane. I'm trying. I'm trying to be vulnerable here. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to take a note um, from Rich. But no, I I don't know. I was just like our faith is like a really like it is like a really important part of mental health is keeping up a like a faith life, and whether that faith life looks like I don't know. You just like take five minutes to yourself and are quiet. Okay, that's, here's that's, the thing. That, but but then there are real but but at the same time there are real mental illnesses. Here's the that, thing. Wait, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> there are real mental illnesses that people do need to seek like licensed help. I don't want to get saying, I don't want to get too aggressive saying, in this I'm argument. just saying no. that I thought it was funny that I had that same thought that Eric did. And I'm like, what generation? Well, that's not what, surprising. What generation am I a part of? Will is know. not a part of this generation, if you're wondering. Sarah's going to put me on blast here. She's going to no, tell I me will. that I'm an insensitive jerk. I no, w- but I, I wasn't saying anything. I don't think you're an insensitive jerk. I just think I'm out. Sorry, I just got a splinter. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping that in. <laughs> um, I, I think everyone should have therapy. I don't th- – it's not some like – Everyone should have someone who can they can talk to and be vulnerable with. For sure. Yes, yeah. and I think that can help guide them. Therapy looks different for different people. Yes, I don't think you have to have going. You don't have to have I don't a, think you, you have, have to, to have go have... through trauma or serious issues or serious stress because a lot of people. I think the whole world de- deals with anxiety and depression. In oh, hundred percent. Every I think every single person does. Yes, so but I think every single person should go to therapy. I well, want to go to therapy. No. <laughs> I, no, I know. I think everything everybody should I don't think faith here here's no, here's what I'm saying. And I think here's what Eric was trying to say, but he didn't say it in a very graceful way. To be what, fair, what Will thinks say, that Eric is the greatest role in the show. <laughs> Continue. He is the best role. I'm not saying he's the best human. No, 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 that's fine. He's the I think he's the best role. What I'm trying to say is that like, yes, we all have trauma or anxiety or depression and we all deal with those different things at different times in our lives but therapy looks different to different people right therapy won't always look like going to a shrink and talking about your feelings therapy can look can be different for different people that's what that's what i'm claiming and then there are instances where like yeah like people need like people have real mental illnesses and like that's a like that's like important that people that you treat that as such. I need to just but, stop referring to it as a real mental illness, and that's the reason you don't to think go to anxiety therapy. is a real mental illness. No, I'm just saying that. Like, I feel like the way you're phrasing it is like, if you have a real mental illness, then you should go to therapy. I think everyone should go to therapy. I think Eric obviously needed you, and, and, needed and to, to be go clear, to therapy. And and to be clear. You when you say everyone needs to go to therapy, you mean like a licensed psychologist who they sit down with and talk about their feelings, like yeah. their problems with. Yeah, I think everyone has faced some form of trauma in their lives. Yeah, but isn't the, and this is a wider discussion that can go on for. I'm but not, let me I'm not finish equipped. my thought. Okay, sorry. You keep screaming. I think that Eric should have gone to therapy. Oh, and if he 100%. did, then he wouldn't be where he is right now but also obviously his faith did not save him from where he's at right now and what he went through because he's cheating on his wife he's going you know he lost his job true he didn't have saved like he has not set himself up for success even though he was a devout catholic right so i'm just saying his faith did not help him get past that trauma oh 100 no yeah yeah it's it's he ironic that it's therapy. ironic to, to to that he says that yeah that he, like yeah like you're the one who needs therapy dude because you were in new york city on 9-11 right that doesn't mean that i guess i'm just saying that like i don't 
agree with you that like everybody needs to sit down with a licensed psychologist. Okay, I think we can agree to disagree. I can agree with you on that. I think we're good um, to move where on. Where we are, we, yeah. we want to move on. I'm uh, so just sorry a couple... about the plot points for really sporadic people. So I hope you're able. No, to... That's okay. Like no, like I just have like a couple things here that like I didn't get to. Um, just some random stuff that I wrote down as I was going through. We really didn't touch on Momo, but she's a whole other. I, I don't feel like we. I have don't feel like I have the. The mental caliber to hit on what momo was all about so momo is the, <laughs> is the grandma with with alzheimer's or dementia and i just wrote down ah a character with alzheimer's to symbolize that we forget the old as they forget us i wrote down oh that's that's the most lit thing you've said tonight oh wow thank you i wrote down when i when we find out that amy has a stomach ailment which is what assertive colitis or whatever i forget what it's called i think that's it I was just like, ah, classic Chekhov right there. Oh, the basic... Why is that classic Chekhov? I don't know. Everybody in Chekhov has, like, a stomach ailment, <laughs> don't they? <laughs> like, but it's, like, very vague and, like, ah, yes, the stomach hurts. That's, like, a real disease, though. No, I know. But oh, okay. to, to write a character in a play with a certain yeah. disease is yeah. Chekhov. Chekhovian. Anyway. Oh, the quote. Did you read the quotes at the beginning of the play? wondering like why he decided to include those because he includes one about like these are the six basic fears of every human that i just found it off-putting i will say that at the beginning of this play i was like this play is so obsessed with itself that it's calling it itself Ooh, this is called the humans and like this is a portrait of daily life in america i will admit that i did not like the first 10 pages of this play and i was like this play needs to get over itself it feels so self-important and it's so it feels so disingenuous obviously i grew to like it over the course of the play <laughs> i like um, how you just like give that shout out and you're just like yeah i hated it but now i love it yeah i mean moving like, on. i mean yeah moving on i'm just just little notes let's see i wrote down it is refreshing to see normal people on stage. I feel like all of these people are very normal. Oh my gosh, they I know are, every single one of they these people. Are, they are almost annoyingly normal. Like, there's nothing special about any of these people, which is incredible that he wrote that because we we want to we're so used to like seeing like captain america on screen and like there's and like that all these play huge, reference. I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> whatever and all these all these huge personalities on stage but these people are so real it's amazing there's a line where deirdre says like so richard what are some of your family traditions and your father always asks me that at every Thanksgiving or Christmas, or at, and like Shout I've been dating, we've Nelson. been together for five year, five plus years, and he still asks me that. And whenever there's a new person, he hates it. He, yeah, five. That's what I said. Five plus. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and whenever there's a new person, he'll always ask that new person, like, so I'm what are some of your I'm sorry he's No, it's just so funny. No, I just thought I it was funny. That he, that exact line was I in did there. see it, yeah. Um, I wrote down, like, capitalism has cast all these people out, except for Richard, who is just born into money, but can't access it till he's 40. I feel like you're hating on Richard for having a trust fund. It's not his I am, fault. I am hating on Richard for having a trust fund. I just want to trust fund. That'd be nice. Oh, my gosh. He's freaking awesome. All right. Freaking awesome. Um, then this um, next segment. So, yeah. So, I just have a question. Oh, yeah. Um, the challenge of producing this is oh, yeah. the set. I it, think that's why it's not, like, super massively produced, even though it a, should be. You need fantastic need actors, and you need a two-story set. A two-story set that is functional. Yeah. That's one of the like beautiful things about this play and about the monster that is this play is that all the actors being on stage all the time, that creates such an interesting like dynamic yeah. for the actors to play with and for the director to create those stage pictures. Right. So I don't know. It's like such a beautiful challenge, but right. I get it. I was saying, I said to Sarah earlier today, I was like, oh, like I think this play is going to be like really like exploding in like regional theaters pretty soon here but then as you're saying that like the two-story set is going to hold a lot of people back which stinks yeah it's such a good story and, and you need actors who are fantastic holy cow like they've got to be really really <laughs> and good. they have to be on constantly yeah i mean the writing Thankfully is it's like a pretty very, short it's pretty yeah, short yeah the writing is very overlapped I yeah it's it, it's naturalism but it's got to be rehearsed so precisely yeah which is so hard to do it's yeah. like everything has to come about naturally it's incredible yeah so yeah why this play now 
why produce it now? My teachers always ask us That's, this. I, I literally wrote that down because I, I wrote down because our society is collapsing. And that's what this play shows is that all these people, like I wrote, like, like all these people are outcasts of capitalism. Right. Deirdre is a woman who's been at the same job for, I, th- I think she said like 40 years. She, yeah. Yeah. yeah she right out of high school. That's right. Yeah. And she gets paid diddly squat. And these 20 year olds or I don't know, 30 year olds are her boss says, And like, she, like she says like the, the office could not run without me. Like the dad, you know, he's fired from his job. Doesn't have Amy, savings. Amy is going to be fired from her job very soon because of she keeps missing time for her illness. Um, and so she and she's a lawyer. No, she's a legal assistant. Yeah, she's a legal assistant, but she keeps missing time. So that stinks. So like these are all people who have worked their entire lives and were at one point like like at an OK spot. But then. Got capitalism most people <laughs> capitalism is so precarious for so, so for many people because if one thing goes wrong everything that you've saved Crumbles. could be out the door very very soon yeah um so that's why we need universal health care right momo they can't afford to like have someone take care of her right a hundred dollars they keep saying like a hundred dollars a night, night for for her to be looked after right so then they have to do it themselves and they can barely handle it and she keeps having fits and they you know she almost like touches a stove at some point yeah. like she has to be watched like constantly right um and yeah and they're it's just left to eric and deirdre who are barely clinging on that's why i, I always say that think, why does play now yes no because our society is crumbling <laughs> and ripping apart at the seams i totally agree with that and i think I think why this play now, I think it shows, like you were kind of talking about before, that generational mindset and seeing that yes. uh, conversation take place on stage, um, I think is quite extraordinary and yes. needs to be seen given the state of our world, the old and the young. The old and the what young. What are the conversations? What are the young believing now? What are the old still believing? You know, it's yeah. like, that was. This play could also be called OK Boomer. <laughs> No. And with that, let's move on to our favorite segment and yours. Let's cast the freaking play. Man. Let's cast the freaking play. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Um, cast the play as as for like a film adaptation or like just a, a, re- a revival. Yeah. I whatever. mean, like, like we're casting like, it with you, celebrities. Who are you freaking <laughs> casting in this freaking play? Like, right. let's go through it. You want to just go character by character? Great. Okay. Let's start with Eric. Eric, who I maintain is the lead and the yeah i would say he's a protagonist i had a hard time with this he's supposed to be 60 years old yes but also like women want to bang him because he cheats on he cheats with some he's like kind of hot because he cheats on his wife with some high school teacher yeah i don't know so like he is like pretty attractive i guess right so at first We'll do what I was thinking at first. Yeah, take us through the process. I will. Uh, so at first I was leaning towards Ed Harris. Ed Harris, yeah. Yeah, because he has like this good nature about him, yeah. like you feel for him, but also I, he's con- can be condescending. For sure. And he's kind of hot. Nice eyes. He is, he is, yeah. He's, like he's pretty handsome. Yeah, for sure. You know? He's a little old. He's a little old. He's a little old. He's, yeah. he's not, you, yeah. So, unfortunately, I How could not go with he? Ed is Harris. Is he like 75? N- no, he's, he's 69, 72, maybe. One of those two ages. He's 69, 72. I don't remember. Got it. Whatever that means to you. <laughs> um, so, then I decided, and please don't hate me, world. I decided to go with Tony Goldwyn. See, I've heard the name. I don't know who that is. Who is Tony Goldwyn? The president of the United States <laughs> on Scandal. Oh, on Scandal. <laughs> oh, wow. He's a catch. Yeah. Whoa. He's, like, pretty hot, but also he's like cannot. He's, he's almost too hot. No, no, no. But I think we also see him in really hot scenes. It was a bold choice, but it was a as choice. As long as <laughs> – he's also the voice of Tarzan in, in cartoon Tarzan, so as long as he's dressed like Tarzan, I'm fine. Perfect. Yeah. Who do you choose? Um, look. I struggled because I was gonna go with Rob Reiner, is is a really good actor, and I think he could he could definitely do it. But he's not, he's not he doesn't have that like he's not hot. He is a great actor, I think, and I think he embodies the character really well. But I just and could. then I kept, I kept going. And this is gonna sound stupid, but like Give look, if you've got like a really big budget movie or whatever, 
who are you gonna get you're gonna get the one and only uh, thomas hanks <laughs> To play this guy because Tom Hanks, because no. here here's here and, and this is selfish of me. This is selfish of me because I am, I think one. I think Tom Hanks is a wonderful actor, and he keeps taking these stupid roles where he's in like these huge movies. He's like in this one like World War Two movie. He's in the Spy, the Bridge of Spies movie. He's in the Sully Sullenberger movie. He's Mr. Rogers. He's playing these huge characters. He's freaking Walt Disney. I just, I want to see Tom Hanks just tear this role to shreds. I think he's a good actor. I think he would really, really do a good job. I don't think I agree with you. Wow, really? I would see Rob Reiner more than Tom Hanks. Rob Reiner surely has the energy. I think, I think, let's put it to a vote. I think... Rob Weiner. <laughs> Rob Reiner wins. How the old role is he? I didn't actually Eric. look up how old he was. Well, let's move on to Deirdre. Okay, and let's all go up. to. If, look, I was really struggling with Deirdre because he's seventy-three, so that's a little rough. Rob Reiner is seventy-three. Oh, that's yeah, that's really rough. Yeah, Tom Hanks. Thanks. Um, um so Mr. Tony Goldwyn. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. We're gonna get Woody the sheriff to be <laughs> Eric. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Deirdre. I didn't find anyone. I don't know, and I. I can't said. Who'd you say? Allison Janney. Who's that? Yeah, I know who that is. She's not. She's not. Unfortunately, she's not the weight. I know, cause it does. But I'm just like. She, there's a continual references to. Right. Like, I'm saying she struggles with her weight. She could. She could struggle with transform. her weight. Transform. She's really tall too. Or. So I had a gal named Kathy Kinney, who's a real actress, uh, who's got the look, but I do not know if she's a good actress, and I'm sure no, she's fine. I take it back. Okay. Oh. I think <laughs> the role of Deirdre. Yeah. Tilda Swinton. Tilda Swinton. Way too elevated of a language person. Like she, like her voice is like so. I'm Tilda Swinton. I am. Tilda Swinton. I don't know. I don't agree with that. But okay, yeah. why, do, why do you I say stand that? Why do, you, why, do you, why, do you, why do you say Tilda Swinton? I just, I'm just curious. No, I just think she can tra- she transforms herself like very well. Yeah. And she's a brilliant actress. Well, sure. I think she would do a great job. But I get what you're saying. Yeah. So I say either Allison Janney. Allison Janney would kill it. Allison Janney feels more of an earth nature. Yeah. Yeah. Which I feel like is probably more on brand. Yeah. But yeah, Kathy Kinney, you can look her up. She is perfect, and she would be cheap. Because if you're gonna blow your whole budget on Tom Hanks, <laughs> you're gonna. Oh get... We're not getting Tom Hanks. We're getting Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks, listen to this podcast. You're yeah. gonna be in the movie. Let's move on to the role of Amy. Amy, the older daughter. The older daughter who has a sort of coitus. She's so funny. She's really she was funny. one of my favorite parts in this like some really? of my favorite lines yeah is the funniest lines she has some really good she's got to have her. good comic timing <laughs> good comic timing in the script good job steven i decided to cast allison brie allison brie of community yeah interesting which i do hate myself for because hear me out people i'm not a huge fan of allison brie i'm, I'm as surprised either. as you are i'm not either but i feel like she has this like amy kind of has this whiny nature hmm. that i feel like allison brie possesses interesting innately and Alison Brie can be pretty funny oh yeah hmm. I don't know I think I would just believe her great yeah great I don't I don't really have a problem with that I'm just yeah. surprised that you chose her no I know. talked about how you don't like her no me too and I am coming from the same place because I picked Merritt Weaver for Amy honestly your choice is better yeah 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 that's one Sarah that's, has two <laughs> that's I don't know. Kathy Kinney would kill it. <laughs> Everybody look her up. No, Merritt <laughs> Weaver. Great. Actually, Merit that's, Weaver would, that's would, great. Would actually own it. That's that fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great job. She'd be great. Okay. Now, Bridget, who obviously. Hard role. They would come after me for the role. I would but, politely yeah, honestly, turn it down. Honestly, and Bridget give it. is yours for the taking at this point. <laughs> Absolutely love. Um, She's even a singer. She's got, That's the thing. There's a song in this play. Yeah. And she sings. And she's got, she's got to like. And she's, you've got to believe her that she's, like, a really good singer and musician, basically. Yeah, because she cares about keys and what key you sing it in. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, anyway, I don't know if that's going to play into this. So I didn't think about that. But I chose 
Willa Holland, who has like the Thea, look. So Thea in Arrow. Yeah. That's what you wrote in parentheses. I wouldn't have known who that is. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. But she is good. She's fine in Arrow. She's fine. She like she has that like um that energy. She's of got the energy of Bridget, of Bridget for and sure. you could also see her being very much in love with Richard. Like those sweet moments, yeah. I would believe her in, and yep. also believe the moments where she's like an absolute brat. Yeah, for sure, for sure. That's where I was coming from. Interesting. Look, Who did you choose? Look, as Bridget? Florence Pugh would be a ama- an amazing Bridget, but I just thought of that, so I really wrote down mm-hmm. Zoe Kazan because I couldn't think of anyone else. <laughs> I don't think Zoe's, like, I don't think I would fully believe Zoe in the role. Really? Florence, I thought, had too much power. Like, she's she too strong. She possesses too she's much power. Too, yeah. She's too powerful. She, like, really throws, like, hmm. her whole aura is, like, so strong and so here. Where, like, hmm. Rigid is in this point in her life where she's so, like, unsure of herself, unsure of her choices. So... I of course I thought of my girl Florence. Really? Florence Pugh is my favorite actress. Of course I thought of her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just really, she could probably do it because she's fantastic. But I just, in looking at her and thinking about Bridget, I don't know. Okay. That's just where I came from. It's interesting because she, I would I would certainly believe that Merritt Weaver and Florence Pugh are sisters. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. That's why. I'd, that's Allison what I would. Brie and Willa. Yeah, I could see them being sisters. Yeah. So I thought it was. I could see Tom Hanks as their father as well. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, Has Rich, anyone noticed Will's humor? Rich, <laughs> Rich would – I just bring up the same thing over and over again. Rich – who did you pick? James McAvoy. James McAvoy. Ooh, that's – honestly, that's pretty good. That's it's pretty, pretty good. fantastic. Yeah. Because he is older. He's older. Still super hot. Still and super And you would hot. believe – because, like, his – I don't love his American accent, but – Whatever he can do, whatever he wants, forever, in my opinion, in my humble opinion. Yeah, because he's like a social worker. He's like, yeah. I don't know. He's just like very open and with it. And I think James can kind of trans, like, transform into any thing. So yeah, I thought he was the, of the age and type. Yeah, that's good. At first, I was thinking Jude Law, but then he's too old. He's so hot. He's so he. If he was younger, he would be really good. Um, but he is he. I he's aged out of the role, unfortunately. And so as a last-ditch effort, I put Rob Delaney, and I hate that choice. So we're going to put James McAvoy in that one. I think that's a better choice. Um, ew. <laughs> she looked up Rob Delaney, and she says, ew. I mean, he's, mean, not he's, not not he's not a good choice. He's not a good choice. But no. He's too, he's too, one, he's too tall. He's like 6'4". <laughs> six, six, Superficially, he's not good. Um, um, no. You imagine Rob Delaney with Willa Holland. That'd be really funny. Um, but I would believe Willa Holland with uh, with James McAvoy. Yeah. I could see that. And then the last role we have to cast is Momo. Is Momo? And she's got to be super freaking old. She's seventy nine in the script. Yeah. So I said Maggie Smith. And that is literally classic. She would kill it. <laughs> obviously, she would kill it. She would never do it though. She'd never do it. She if you called you. Look, look, you call Maggie Smith right now and you ask her if she wants <laughs> oh, okay. to play to play Momo. I don't think she would do it. Well, what's your Look, choice? I picked the one and only Liza Minnelli. So. <laughs> Not even better. Worse. That's way worse. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Maggie Smith would do it so much more. My sentence didn't make sense. <laughs> she would do it so much more. She would do it so much more. Look. Maggie Smith is a lot better than Liza Minnelli for that role. Of I course, I'm obsessed I, and in love with you, Liza Minnelli, but I, I don't think you're right. <laughs> I almost said Betty White as well, but she'd be too funny. What is wrong with you? <laughs> Look, there's only so many actresses that are 75 Here's the plus. thing. Here's the thing with Maggie and Momo. Um, Why? Yeah. Momo has to be, like, kind of creepy. Yeah. I yeah, think like, like the girls are creeped it. out by her. Yeah, like, she has these fits that freak everyone out, and it's... it says that she li- is, like, possessed. Of those three, I think Maggie could do it the best. I think, uh, yeah, probably. Yeah. I'm just saying she would never do that. Okay. <laughs> but she would probably if Tom Hanks was in the role. So I was going to talk about the real film cast. Oh, yeah, please I want to reveal, yeah, because, okay, so this is something, as we were researching this, I discovered, because as I was reading, I was like, oh, this would make a baller movie. And I was like, and it's in, it was in production in September 2019. There has not been much news since then. 
I feel like they finished filming it, um, but I, I don't know. So. I do not know, honestly. Um, so here's the real film cast as follows. So the Deirdre is played by Jane Howdy Shell, who originated the role on Broadway. So it's like that's Nothing fair. Nothing but respect. Th- that's fair. And she's from, guess where she's from? Topeka, Kansas. I am from Kansas. <laughs> ah, just in Topeka, I understand. If they, um, Richard Jenkins as Eric. Um, if you look him up, you'll know who he is. I forget what he's in. But he's seems like he'd be fine oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah he, that's yeah. great casting yeah that's good that's good not as good as tom um <laughs> <laughs> guess who the sisters are though guess i can you guess they're two pretty well-known actresses i swear like it's I swear not if you it's say not, scarlett johansson it's not, for one of them no, it's not I'll scarlett freak johansson out. it's scarlett johansson and adam driver obviously <laughs> um oh adam driver's richard obviously no, no, that's really off brand. We got Beanie, as I'm guessing. Oh my Bridget. Gosh. It doesn't say on Wikipedia. I felt, on the I, extensive research I did. I feel like I knew that deep down in my soul. Yeah, it's when Beanie. I've stalked Beanie. Beanie is Bridget. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. I'm really excited to like see that. I hope that. that they finish it. I feel. I feel they mixed must have finished it. About they could that. film this whole movie in two weeks. Yeah. So hopefully they did. I feel mixed feelings. I don't love that casting. I mean, Beanie's a good actress, so I can no, sure love, she's fine. I do love Beanie, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see what she does. Yeah. I'm intrigued. As am I. Amy is then Amy Schumer. I was floored. What? I was like, I was like, you got Amy Schumer? Like, she, like she's fine. I don't know. She's... That feels like really, like, what, what movie, what play do they think this is? They think it's train wreck too, obviously. <laughs> that's that's wild. That's, almost, that's that was almost, that was weird. I don't like that. I didn't like I didn't like that either. I'm really I don't other mm. than like they share the same name, but it's not the same spelling. I might have a hard time. You know this. I have a deep love for train wreck. I think it's hilarious. Um and I think I saw it twice in theaters, which is very uncommon for me. But she's I mean, Amy Schumer's funny, so she's got the comedic timing that you were talking about. But she's also like and she's like a fine actress. And then here's here's one for Richard. They pulled went way out of left field. the The actor is South Korean, which I thought was actually a, a bold choice, which I makes thought, sense. Oh my gosh, that's so interesting. Yeah, the actor is because named... I thought about choosing a person of color. Really, for Richard, because I think that adds like another element. Yeah. Of the older generation, other yeah. moments of like talking down. Yeah, I think for that sure. adds like a. Yep. A bad layer. Yep. Um, <laughs> Uncomfy. Yeah, but like, yeah, but like, I never got vibes that like, like Eric and Deirdre were racist. I don't know. I'd have to see it. <laughs> I'd have to see that casting and see how it read and yeah. see if it would. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But the actor's name is Steven Ewan. Say who Momo was? I, you know, I, it did, but I didn't write it down. And she was somebody I'd never heard of. Great. So. Awesome. It was Liza Minnelli. Oh my <laughs> gosh. You're... You're absolutely insane. I know. I can't wait to hear future casting. <laughs> Look, I'm not going to pretend that I'm a casting director. Okay, here's our next segment. What we watching? What we going to watch? This is where we talk a little bit, just briefly, about, like, what are you doing? What are you doing with your life? Yeah, so, like, my teachers like to ask this a lot randomly yeah. during class. They'll be like, hey, what are you watching? And then we'll talk about something like on Netflix TV for, like, shows. a million years. Yeah. But, um, you know, you know this because we watch it together. But sure. I want to watch another episode. We watched Insecure. Yeah, we started Insecure. That was good. That was great. Yeah, I don't, Issa Rae is, like, so charming and, like, um, yeah. I don't, yeah, I'm, like, really interested to see where it goes. I really liked it, and I thought it was really funny. Mm-hmm. I don't know. For sure. And then, also, I watched The Great British Baking Show a lot On when repeat. I'm, like, working out or cooking to calm me down or when i'm working on a school assignment that's giving me extra anxiety i, I don't even watch it, it. Is, it's in the background it is the most soothing show that you could ever pick it's incredible it's so good i love it i love it too honestly yeah. just like no, no 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 jokes i deeply love <laughs> great british baking show but i also cannot just sit down and watch it without like i can stop i can stop and check in on it you right. Know? right i can't i can't just sit down and watch it it's not interesting enough <laughs> great i'm watching uh the last dance michael jordan documentary which is fantastic if you like sports if you don't like sports it's going to 
affirm for you why you don't like sports <laughs> <laughs> for sure hence why i'm not watching yeah i'm watching that by myself and after that i don't know i want i really want to watch the wire on hbo yeah really want to watch that and one. and we're watching run run which is fine yeah i'm not crazy about it you know it's a half hour episode once a week so it's fine well great um i think we can finish up the episode here so we're gonna give you the reading assignment for next week's episode which is what is it william betrayal by harold pinter <laughs> Will and I have never read this, and I've always Neither wanted to. I. I said Will and I. Neither have I. <laughs> um, and I've always wanted to, so um, I'm really excited. So am I. It'll be good. It'll be good. It's sad. Sad. Dark. Dark, which is what we're all about. I don't about. think I've ever read any Pinter play, which is terrible. We're going to discuss the Pinter pause, who Harold Pinter is, all that good stuff. Pinters and pies. But thank you so much for joining us this week. And I don't know, we're really excited about this. We're glad that so many of you are excited. And um, slide into our DMs on Instagram at... At uh, the underscore playwright, right? The underscore play underscore rights. Got it, got it. Will's yeah, really good. <laughs> I gotta remember. Um, uh, rights spelled W-R-I-G-H-T-S, which is actually how you're supposed to spell playwrights. So, fun fact. That is pretty fun. Um, <laughs> um, and yeah, give us play suggestions, tell us we're idiots, whatever. Whatever you, why, why is that always your go-to to have people tell us we're idiots? Well, because people like to respond when they don't agree with something, maybe create some controversy, create controversy. We love us. controversy, um, sometimes, but, um, no, say please. say really provocative things on this podcast, so. Sure. Would love to have some of you on, and don't be afraid to reach out, and can't wait to talk to you guys next week on The Playwrights. Ba-da-ba-ba-da-ba.